Welcome you to the combined Good Friday service of Grace Presbyterian Church and Christ Church Presbyterian. My name is Clayton Willis. I'm the pastor of Christ Church Presbyterian in Irvine. Well, as we strive in obedience to Jesus to be good neighbors and to be good citizens, to forego in-person gathering together for worship, we pray that the Lord will use this time to increase our longing to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to draw us closer to him, and to turn our eyes to the things that matter for eternity. In the midst of anxiety and uncertainty, we are reminded by this service about the certainty of our salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus. This Good Friday service recounts the final events leading to Jesus' crucifixion and death. With each reading, we are shown how prophecy is fulfilled and that fulfillment demonstrates that Jesus is the promised Messiah. He is, without doubt, the only Lord and Savior. In this service, we have a series of scripture readings read by myself and ruling elders Robert Olson and Douglas McLeath. These are then followed by a sermon preached by Pastor Ben Merson. Each reading of this and the sermon is followed by a hymn. It's the practice of Grace Presbyterian Church to sing an amen at the end of each hymn. The amen shows our agreement with what we have just sung together, assenting to its truth and confessing it as our own beliefs. Well, as we read through the events of Jesus' last hours, notice that this service deliberately ends with Jesus' death and burial. He is, in a sense, left in the tomb until our celebration of his resurrection on Sunday. So let us begin our service. I bring you greetings in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. As we come into our worship service, please pray with me. Almighty God, We come before you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is our advocate with you. He is the only mediator between God and man. He always lives to make intercession for us. As you have called us to your throne of grace today, we come boldly through him, clothed in his imputed righteousness. Let us remember that it was our sins that he bore on the cross. Let us be reminded of all that he suffered in his betrayal, his rejection, his false trial, his mocking, and his crucifixion, that we would not treat our sin or our salvation lightly. Even in light of Christ's suffering for our sins, we confess that we have and continue to sin against you in thought, word, and deed. We have done what we ought not to do and have left undone what we ought to have done. O Lord, look on us in your tender mercy. Hear our confession and forgive us for the sake of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we hear your word today, we pray that your Holy Spirit would illumine our minds so that we would rightly understand and apply your word to our thoughts, words, and actions, that you would be glorified in our lives. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our first reading is from John chapter 13. Verses 12 through 30. 
When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Jesus, that Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. At the time of the Passover, the Jewish religious leaders were seeking to put Jesus to death. As Jesus and the disciples gathered together for the Passover feast, he made two startling announcements. First, that one of those men seated at that very table would betray him. And second, that betrayal would itself be the fulfillment of Scripture, namely Psalm 41.9. In this passage, we learn that the true Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world would be betrayed by one of his closest friends and handed over to be killed. This is one of several prophecies that were fulfilled in the suffering and death of Jesus, showing him with certainty to be the long-awaited Messiah. In response to this, let us sing together, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, which is printed for you in your bulletin, but you can also follow along in Trinity Hymnal number 247.
Our second reading is about Jesus' rejection found in John 15, verses 18 through 27. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus explained to his disciples that the religious leader's rejection of him fulfilled Old Testament prophecy, specifically Psalm 69, 4, that they hated him without cause and attacked him with lies. He revealed that he was the righteous sufferer to propitiate God's wrath for sins, not for his own sins, but for the sins of his people. As we think about what Christ suffered on the cross, let us sing together Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, hymn number 257. on Jesus' trial in John chapter 18, verse 28 through chapter 19, verse 16. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. 
they themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the others and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he had made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who has delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to them to be crucified. We see in this description of Jesus' trial, the willingness with which he submitted himself to the fulfilling of the work the Father had given him. He did not try and defend himself before Pilate or plead his innocence before the religious leaders. At this point, Jesus could have been killed by stoning, by being pelted with rocks. This was a sentence that the Jews sometimes unlawfully carried out by mob violence. For example, we have the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. But the religious leaders wanted Jesus publicly crucified. They wanted all Jerusalem to see his failing and his shame. His ministry had been very public, his his claims grandiose. His death, therefore, they thought should also be public and shameful to reveal that he was not Israel's Messiah. We see the religious leaders' plan to have Jesus crucified in verse 6 when they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And yet what they demanded was all part of God's divine plan. 
God records earlier, or John records earlier in his gospel that Jesus said, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, speaking of the cross, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. As part of our worship service, we confess our faith together, and we will be doing that now using the Nicene Creed as our confession of faith. You find that printed for you uh, in your bulletin. Let's all confess together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our fourth reading is from Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 to 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. The mocking that Jesus endured stemmed from the sinfulness of those who did not believe he was the promised Messiah sent from God. And Jesus' demeanor toward those who mocked him and insulted him revealed his willingness to endure the shame and the scorn of the cross. The Bible teaches that Jesus not only bore the penalty of our sins, but also the shame of them, as he endured the humiliation from the soldiers and then later the crowds. 1 Peter 2, 23, we read that when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly. Our response is hymn 252, When I Survey the Wonders Cross.
Our fifth reading is of the crucifixion from John 19, the second half of verse 16 through verse 27. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered him, Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who, whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. The actual act of nailing Jesus to the cross and being lifted up on it is given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in just four words. There they crucified him. The physical pain and agony that our Lord Jesus experienced in our place for our sins is contained in these four words. More detail is given about the inscription above Jesus and the soldiers casting lots for his clothes than the actual crucifixion. But this is not to diminish the physical suffering of our Lord. The Holy Spirit is shining a spotlight on the fulfillment of messianic prophecies that would have otherwise gone unnoticed. Pilate's inscription of the crime for which Jesus was crucified, that is, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, proclaimed the kingship of Jesus in fulfillment of many prophecies like Zechariah 9.9 and made Pilate the unwitting first preacher of a crucified Redeemer King. John also shows how God inclined the minds of the Gentile guards to fulfill Psalm 22 by casting lots for Jesus' clothing. In the wisdom of God, even these soldiers were witnesses for Jesus being the Messiah. Our response is hymn 261, What Wondrous Love Is This?
sixth reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, 45 through 54. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. And the tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. What was Jesus experiencing? He was experiencing the curse and penalty of sin as it was imputed to him to the point that he became sin. This is in keeping with Isaiah's prophecy that the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In chapter 2, 24 of 1 Peter, it is explained that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A response of him, him is man of sorrows, what a name, hymn 246. Our seventh reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 44 through 46. 
It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Having fulfilled the work that the Father had given him to do from all eternity, Jesus committed his own human spirit to the Father. He did so knowing that he lived to please the Father and trusting that his Father would vindicate him by raising him from the dead. Our next hymn is Not All the Blood of Beasts, hymn 242. eighth reading is from John chapter 19. We will read verses 28 through 42, which describes Jesus' death and burial. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so They put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. 
So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Before we hear God's word preached, uh, let us go before him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless you with hearts full of joy. With all that is within us, we bless your holy name. And yet, even as we worship, we acknowledge that we have sinned countless times, that we have grieved your Holy Spirit and have hurt others by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Lord, we know that we are as guilty as the mockers who scoffed at the Lord Jesus as he stood nailed to the cross, taking his final breaths. We are as guilty as the soldiers who pressed the crown of thorns deeply into his sinless head. We deserve your wrath just as much as they did. And so we sit in wonder at how you could ever love us as your sons and daughters. Father, forgive us for hearts that so often doubt you. We believe, O Lord. Help our unbelief. Forgive us also for so often believing that our sin is greater than your love and grace. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who never sinned and yet who became sin for us. Thank you, Lord, for willing that his head would be bloodied by the crown of thorns so that our heads might be crowned with glory and honor. Thank you for your deep love that willingly crushed the Lord Jesus so that his wounds could pay our ransom. Lord, you know how weak we are and how prone we are to wander. So give us renewed strength to walk in holiness as your children. Give us hearts and minds that do not forget all of your wonderful blessings to us. Give us, we pray, deep gratitude for all that we have received through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you that nothing can keep us from reaching our heavenly home where we will no longer walk by faith, but we will walk by sight, where we will no longer see as through a glass dimly, but where we will look upon your glory face to face. And now, Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. As we read scripture and hear it preached, may we listen with joy to what you are saying to us. Give us grace to receive your truth and faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The sermon passage is Luke chapter 23, verse 46, which was our seventh reading. There we read, Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now the Bible records for us seven words or utterances that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke from the cross. The first utterance was to the Father, where he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The second word was to the repentant thief on the cross, where he said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The third word was to Mary and John, where he said, Woman, this is your son, and to John he said, This is your mother. Fourth word was to his father, where Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fifth word was one of agony, where he said, I thirst. The sixth word was a declaration of his accomplished work, where Jesus said, it is finished. And the seventh and last word was to the Father, when Jesus said, calling out with a loud 
voice. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now what does <clears throat> this seventh saying reveal about Jesus? What does this seventh saying reveal about Jesus? Well, first it reveals that he accomplished the work of our salvation. He accomplished the work of our salvation. See, just before Jesus said these final words from the cross, we read in Luke chapter 23, verse 45, that the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now, in the Old Testament and during Jesus' lifetime, we know that the temple in Jerusalem was the center of Jewish religion. There were synagogues that served as local meeting places, but the temple served as the central place of worship for the Jews. The temple was the place where animal sacrifices were offered for sins according to Old Testament regulations. And, and part of the temple's structure were that there were two curtains. It was an outer curtain that separated the sanctuary from the courtyard. And then there was an inner curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. It was in the holy of holies, we know, that the high priest would enter in only once a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement, in order to make atonement for the sins of the people. This is what we read about in Leviticus chapter 16. And this curtain, this veil, was probably about 60 feet high and 40 inches thick that the high priest would have to go through. It was massive. And that, that curtain served as a constant reminder of how sin brought separation between God and man. It was a constant reminder of the fact that God is holy and man is sinful and there is no access to God but by atonement. The way to God, it signaled, has been blocked by our sin. But when Jesus bore the curse of God's wrath for our sin on the cross, we read that the curtain, the barrier of sin between us and God, was supernaturally torn in two, from top to bottom, from heaven to earth, opening wide to all God's people access to him. And so in Christ, we are no longer separated from God because our sins have been atoned for. We are now God's children. While Luke and other gospel writers don't specify which curtain it was, whether it was the inner curtain or the outer curtain that was torn, the book of Hebrews uh, leads us to believe that it was the inner curtain that was torn. We read in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, that we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place between the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then the writer of Hebrews explains again in chapter 10, verses 19 through 22, he writes, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. See, when that curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, it signaled that the older covenant types and shadows had been fulfilled in Christ's sacrifice. And so now through Jesus' blood, we are encouraged to draw near to God in full assurance of being accepted and received with joy. In contrast to the old covenant priests who entered the Holy of Holies by the blood of an animal, by blood that could not take away sin, we are assured in Scripture that we do not enter that way. 
We enter instead by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus that was shed for every race and that sprinkles now the throne of grace. Jesus accomplished the work of our redemption. And once, once he did so, he committed his spirit into his father's care. Secondly, this last utterance of Jesus reveals that he willingly surrendered himself to the father's will. He willingly surrendered himself to the father's will. Jesus here records or Luke here records that Jesus said the final words from the cross with a loud voice. This was not the uh, declaration of a helpless victim or of a defeated person. It wasn't a, a whimper, but it was instead the loud declaration of a victorious redeemer. Then Jesus said, we read, with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then, having said this, he breathed his last. Now, John the Evangelist records that Jesus then bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That is, Jesus did so willingly. See, he had come to accomplish our redemption, and once he accomplished it, he willingly surrendered his spirit to his father. Another passage in the Gospels that clearly reveals Jesus' willing surrender, that clearly reveals that Jesus was not a helpless victim, is found in John chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. And I want us to read this passage, and then I want to point out a few things that it reveals about Jesus' sovereignty over the situation. We read in John chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup? that the Father has given me. We see in this passage, Jesus allowed himself to be caught by Judas and the others. John records that Jesus went to the place where he often met with his disciples, with his disciples, including Judas. Now, before this, during the Last Supper in the upper room, Jesus already predicted Judas's betrayal. And we read in this passage that knowing that Judas would betray him, Jesus went to the place where he usually went with his disciples. That's an amazing statement. Because if, if Jesus was trying to escape from getting caught by Judas and the others, you know, he would have gone to a place where he could not be found by them. He would have jumped on a boat like Jonah did and and gotten out of town, gotten as far away from danger as possible. See, that's what a helpless victim would do. But Jesus was not a helpless victim. He wanted to get caught. He wanted to be arrested. He wanted to be crucified because he knew that that's the way that he was going to accomplish our salvation. 
as had been prophesied. We also see evidence that Jesus willingly surrendered himself in the fact that he subdued his sovereign power in order to be arrested. We read that all of the men that were there to arrest him with lanterns and torches, they showed up with weapons. And then Jesus, in verse 4, John chapter 18, knowing all that would happen to him, which indicates that none of this caught him by surprise, Jesus came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. Now one old theologian says that with these words, Jesus gave those hundreds of soldiers a peek at his glory. The glory that resided within him as the divine son of God. There was something at that moment that caused them to fall down as they realized this glorious being who stood before them. See, John clearly intends for us to reflect on the implications of this situation. That if Jesus could cause hundreds of strong soldiers to fall to the ground by just speaking a couple short words, and it's actually two words in the Greek, I am, that's all that Jesus said, John is trying to get us to understand that Jesus could easily have escaped if he wanted to. We also see evidence of Jesus' willing surrender in the way that he stopped Peter and his disciples from defending him against those who came to arrest him. That Peter took out his sword and, and tried to intervene for uh, the Lord Jesus but Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly. See, Jesus was saying to Peter that I don't need you to protect me. I could easily protect myself by speaking just a few words or, or I, could, I could ask my father and he would send angels to protect me. See friends, all, all of this is meant to reveal to us that Jesus was willingly going to the cross. He knew that blood needed to be shed in order for us to be made right with God. And so he willingly and sovereignly endured the cross, despising the shame in order to secure the salvation of his people. And thirdly, and lastly from our passage, and we are considering Jesus last few words from the cross. We see that Jesus' last utterance on the cross reveals that he trusted his Father to the very end. He trusted his Father to the very end. As he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now in this case, Jesus was quoting from Psalm 31 in which David asked God to save him from his enemies. It was an appropriate psalm for Jesus to use because he too was being attacked by enemies and suffering, just like David. And so he uttered David's prayer, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Phil Riken explains, This is the way for every believer to die well by entrusting ourselves entirely to God through faith in Jesus Christ. When Jesus put his spirit into the Father's hands, he was expressing full confidence that death was not the end for him. He believed that there was life beyond the grave. His spirit would survive and his body would be raised. Therefore, Jesus rested complete trust in his father for death and for everything that would come afterwards. From the end of the cross, he could see the light of the empty tomb. He knew the father had always promised to raise his body from the grave and that this would happen on the third day. 
In the meantime, he entrusted his soul to the Father. His last words in life were the first words for going home to the Father. And so he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. See, friends, when we trust in Jesus Christ's finished work on our behalf, we can pray the same prayer with full assurance, knowing that we also will be received in glory at death. Knowing with full assurance that the moment that we close our eyes in death, the very next moment we will open them in glory. Why? Why can we have such assurance? Well, because our shepherd, brother, savior, and friend has gone before us. He has opened the way for us to enter God's presence without fear and shame. He has washed us with his blood. This is the prayer that Stephen, the first martyr, prayed in Acts chapter 7. We read that as Stephen was being pelted with rocks by the angry mob, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Dear believer, if you trust in Christ, you have been made acceptable to God. You have been given access. You and I now in Christ have the assurance that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, where we will behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ for an eternity. Amen. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for Christ who was condemned in our place. We thank you for his obedience to your covenant requirements. We thank you that the work he accomplished has been imputed to us. And we thank you that the covenant curses that we deserved for our sin were imputed to him. Help us to always remember that we are in union with our Savior. Help us, Lord, to live as those who are redeemed and freed from the bonds of sin. Help us to live in unity as brothers and sisters, showing humility and kindness toward one another, even as we were shown such kindness by our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. We will now sing our closing hymn, which is hymn 254, Alas, and did my Savior bleed.
Receive now the blessing from your triune God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.